Up first, we have Dr. Franz de Leon. He is the director of DOST ATSTI, the former chair of the Aurora Interim Governing Board, and he is being invited as a member to sit on the strategic circle. Um, Dr. Franz, as I mentioned, is the director of the Department of Science, Technology, Advanced Science Technology Institute. Um, he has been long involved in the advanced fields of ICT, microelectronics, and long-term research to strengthen and modernize science and technology infrastructure in the Philippines. He is also an associate professor from the Electronic and Electronics Engineering Institute of the University of the Philippines, uh, Diliman. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Electronics and Communications Engineering in 2003. Um, he further went on to do his master's in electrical engineering in 2005 and has recently earned his PhD from the University of Southampton in the UK. He believes that in during these challenging times, there is a need for solutions and applications that will uplift our spirits and help adjust us to the new normal post-COVID-19. Thank you so much, Doc Franz, for agreeing to be on this panelist, and we look forward to hearing from you. Up next, we have Arvin Siena. He's the vice chair of the Aurora Governing Board and VP and head of network design at PLDT and SMART. He's worked for PLDT for nearly 30 years, uh, leading telecommunications and digital services in throughout the Philippines. Um, PLDT offers a wide range of telecommunications and digital services um, across their extensive fiber optic background. Um, his prior designations at PLDT include VP, Head of Technology, Strategy, Transformation Office, Head of Core Network Planning, Engineering, Head of Transport Planning and Engineering, and also Head of Access Planning and Engineering, and Head of Network Planning and Engineering. We're very much looking forward, uh, Mr. Siena, to hearing your perspective um, from that of PLDT and also your nearly 30 years industry experience. And once again, on behalf of the Aurora team, thank you so much for participating with us today. Up next, we have Vincent Ache Atenza, who is going to be um, Speaking from the Globe Telecom Peering and Interconnection Strategy perspective, he's been there for over a decade. He's also the Secretary of the Asia Pacific Network Information Center Executive Council, and as I believe, the first Filipino to hold this position. So congratulations. Um, we're very excited to have you on board today. Um, over at Globe, he's responsible for managing the end-to-end -end evolution optimization of Globe's IP e ecosystem, focusing on core infrastructure that functions as the local and international internet gateway. Uh, prior to joining Globe, he managed the internet services portfolio for the Eastern Telecommunications Philippines Incorporated. Um, outside of Globe, he's very passionate about improving the internet and peering ecosystem of his home country, while also contributing to the global internet community. community. Um, he's been instrumental in the Philippine Network Operations Group, the rebirth of it, and has been leading the group since 2015. Um, Ache is also a member of the Board of Trustees for the Internet Society Philippines chapter since 2013. Uh, as I mentioned, last February, he was elected as part of the Asia Pacific Network Information Center, the first and only Filipino to be on the board. Um, he also leads several internet working groups and program committees with speaking engagements at um, international internet conferences. Thank you so much, Ache, uh, for also agreeing to be on this panel, and we are very much looking forward to hearing your views and perspectives on Open RAN and how that's going to impact not only the Philippines, but the Indo-Pacific region. And to tie off our panel, we have Dr. J.B.D. Guzmao. He is an associate professor uh, at the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute, the University of Philippines, Diliman. Um, he completed his PhD at the University of New South Wales in Sydney on security and privacy for future and arising technologies, such as the Internet of Things, wearables, and mixed reality. In addition to this, he has worked on communication and computer networks and has co-authored and presented multiple papers at multiple international conferences, including development of a handshake system for TV white space applications based on OFDM back in 2015. Uh, characterization of power line communications using FSK for home applications in 2014 and further. Thank you so much, Dr. Guzman, also for being on our panelists today, and we are very much looking forward to your views and opinions from the academic perspective. Moving forward to kick us off, we're going to start with Dr. Franz to present on the government's perspective relating to Open RAN. Over to you, Dr. Dion. Thank you, Catherine. 
Yeah, so you're here. Um, my perspective or the government's perspective on open RAN. So next slide, please. All right. Um, what you can see on the screen um, is the open run value chain um, estimate for 2025. So it is a range per um, category. And um, you can see that the open run value chain um, is divided into six major technology and service categories. First, let's say we have um, chips and components or semiconductors. So this category includes design and manufacturing of chipsets and related radio components required to build open run elements such as radio units, active antennas, and distributed and centralized server units. So this would account around 11% of the value chain. Next, we have, let's say, um, RAN hardware. So this um, category includes design and manufacturing of hardware elements for radio units antennas, distributed server units, and small cell uh, products. So this would account 24%. Next, we have um, RAN software. So this consists of RAN functions that used to be embedded in hardware, but can now run independently on cloud hardware. So these pieces of software are called virtualized or containerized network functions. So this category includes new platforms for automation, management, and orchestration of the RAN elements. So that's over the count uh, 9%. Fourth, we have um, cloud color green. So this category is focused on infrastructure, both at the edge and core data centers running open RAN software managed by cloud orchestrators. So that would account for 80%. Fifth, we have services, colored gray. So this uh, category includes system integration and testing to ensure that software and hardware from many suppliers can work optimally together. So that would account the majority, uh, which is 38%. The last uh, bit, which is unquantified, um, is development, colored pink. So this includes activities to contribute and build open run ecosystems from corporate R&D labs to incubators, standards organizations, open source collaborations, and labs that share and validate technology. So as you can see, um, open, has, open run has a pretty big spectrum, and there's an emphasis, let's say, on the cloud and the software, which would be quite bigger than in previous um, technologies. Well, for me, of course, coming from um, the Department of Science and Technology, my perspective would be on the development, uh, the pink one. So next slide, please. All right, so just to, to highlight the, the importance of the development category. So this category of the value chain consists of all activities that would contribute to fostering an open RAN ecosystem. So meaning from incubators such as the um, telecom Infra Project Ecosystem, or TIP, um, universities with projects focused on 5G and Open RAN, or even labs set up by operators or sponsored by governments like the OST, to standards organizations such as ETSI or the Open RAN um, Alliance. So the range from pure uh, research projects, universities, or corporate R&D labs to incubators that would help um, commercialize some of those findings through startups, to the standard or organization and open source um, collaborations and labs that share and validate the technology. So we want to maximize the impact of all these activities through funding and by creating collaborative frameworks across the region and between industry and academia, uh, which are important ways through which policymakers can simulate the open RAN ecosystem. So um, having established the, the Open RAN um, Academy actually paves the way for more um, development or activities and research, would then, which would then eventually translate to um, more innovations in terms of services and even um, revenue generation for uh, the network operators. So the, that's how important um, the development is and how um, Asia Open Run um, Academy can contribute to, to that space. Next slide, please. All right, so 
um, I'll be showing some bits and pieces of the current capabilities, at least from the OST ASTI, which may, may contribute as a platform for research and development. So for example, um, the OST ASTI is managing um, the country's uh, premier high performance um, computing. So as I've said earlier, many of the functions in the open run are transitioning from pure hardware or mostly hardware, specialized hardware into virtualizations and other services that can be done um, in software. I guess that's the beauty of, of Open RAN. Instead of having specialized hardware for every function, we could possibly have a more um, generic architecture and then any updates or improvisations or innovations can come um, through computing, which means it would require actually a lot of computing power. So for now, uh, we have this facility at ASTI, which could be used um, um, for, for that uh, function uh, as the brain of, of, of computing. Next slide, please. So if we have the brain, we need the pipes, the nerves for uh, the data. And for that, we have the Philippine Research Education and Government Information Network or uh, PREGENET, PREGENET, which is uh, the Philippines only research and education networks. So aside from this, um, so, well, the main purpose of, of PREGENET is, is of course to connect different research um, institutions, uh, whether public or private, locally, and even um, across um, ASEAN region and, and connection through the world. So they provide large pipes for interconnecting data or uh, delivering data, which are primarily uh, used for, for R&D. Moreover, um, it also houses the PHOpenIX, which is a neutral um, internet exchange uh, box um, among different uh, players. So again, this would add to the ecosystem, which can be used as a platform for developing um, R&Ds for, for Open RAN. Next slide, please. And then on the service space, uh, we have the Electronics Product uh, Development Center. This is located actually in, in, in Bikutan. So some of the activities that can be done include PCB fabrication, assembly, 3D printing, testing, product safety testing, and more importantly, electromagnetic compatibility testing and um, electromagnetic sus susceptibility um, tests. So if it comes to a point where in um, hardware can be developed or even components can be developed in the open run space, then there's already a facility that can be used for testing those um, hardware or components. So those are just a sample of the existing facilities that may, may, may be used for R&D activities in the open run space. Next slide, please. All right, let's move on to the government pol uh, policies uh, supporting open RAN. So um, I've collected uh, three um, across the world. So first, um, in the US, in December 2020, um, their Congress passed the US Telecommunication Act as part of its annual defense um, authorization um, act, establishing the Public Wireless Supply Chain Innovation Fund. Now, uh, through this program, grants may be used to offset the cost of procuring open RAN equipment, uh, multi-vendor integration, deploying security features and open networks, or deploying network function virtualization to manage an open network. Second, um, in Japan, um, they have an act on the promotion of development supply and development of specified advanced information and communication technology utilization system, which um, offers financial incentives and tax benefits to companies that develop, supply, or deploy 5G equipment that meets certification criteria in terms of security, uh, supply, and openness. And then in the UK, um, in, July, in July 2021, they launched a 30 million uh, British Pound uh, future run um, competition to fast track open run development and discover and fund 
talented open RAN specialists. Meaning, so these countries are really um, setting up the perfect environment to stimulate um, innovation and accelerate um, activities in the open RAN space. Um, I guess the Philippines, through its um, 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 Congress, might want to um, pass um, bills that would, would be similar to, to these um, um, policies, that which would really um, encourage and accelerate the development of open run activities in any of of, um, of of a particular activity which I've mentioned earlier, uh, that, which is uh, more appropriate in, in the local context. Um, maybe maybe special mention, of course, um, towards supporting um, R and D activities um, in the country. So you have, let's say, a local support. Uh, for uh, importation of open run equipment. And of course, there can be incentives for companies who are doing R&D work, which are related to open run um, space. So there's uh, a lot of opportunities for the country really to support um, the whole um, um, open run um, initiatives. And that can be, of course, leveraged by, by the government, by uh, supportive policies and more importantly, probably allocating more uh, budget for this. So those are just some of the perspectives from the government. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining this, uh, uh, this forum. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, why Oran and a little bit of uh, an overview on the hype and what's going to happen, you know, what, what's happening today and beyond for, for Open Run. So, so why Oran? You know? So what, what, what is it that mobile operators across the world are um, um, looking for uh, in an Open Run environment? You know? So we know that in the olden days, well, until today, you know, the telecommunication equipment, specifically radio uh, infrastructure, um, it's actually vertically integrated. No? So it's composed of hardware, software, etc. So moving forward, it's going to be in the, the network is going to be a software environment. No? Every, everything will be disintegrated or disaggregated, and it will be integrated in such a manner that uh, will make them function uh, properly. So it gone are the days in an open environment where in an oral environment where you will have um, um, specific vendors no? uh, that will not interoperate with each other. No? So the, 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 the promise of open run cell site, you create a base station which is composed of many different players in the ecosystem, no? antenna, radio, hardware, um, that can be integrated and plug and play no? by, by mobile operators. No? So this is the promise. And with, with that promise, it creates a lot of opportunities for mobile operator to, to create more innovations, no? to improve the, the services, no? and more, more importantly, to drive down cost. Right, so this is the differentiator that all operators across the world no, are um, um, trying to leverage no, in, an, in an open run environment. So they have to innovate, they have to make sure that their system are capable of uh, providing and addressing the customer needs no, uh, at any point in time, no, by just you know, increasing and manipulating uh, in their own uh, network the capacity expansion, etc. It's actually a network on demand uh, that uh, enables uh, that will be enabled by by Open Run, and it will become um, extremely important for them because it's going to drive down their operating cost. Uh, the mere fact that you, you can, they can deal with many vendors in the ecosystem without having held hostage by any major vendor, there will be no more major vendor in an open run environment. No? Everything will be a level playing field no? uh, for, for smaller player, for bigger player, 
etc. Nobody will have the monopoly now of uh, the 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 supplier uh, environment. No? So, but but where do we start? No, what is the value? Uh, what is the overarching need that this mobile operator across the world should should consider? First, first off is of course at the end of the day this is business. No how much it will cost us, right? Because the higher the cost, the higher the price that we offer our services to the customers. The lower the cost, the lower we can bring down our price uh, of services to our customers. So the total cost of ownership is very important uh, uh, to the operators. No? In, it also uh, discussed about or ensure that the dimensioning and the capacity planning process no? uh in the current environment will be different no it will be uh relatively simple no in 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 an open run environment and this is something that we need to prove this is something that the operator need to prove how different it is and how uh much advantage it has based on the current as compared to the current systems that are in place definitely the scope will be different Definitely, uh, it will be larger in terms of supply chain, but it will be simpler in terms of increasing and upgrading your capacity. But the big question is, how do we start? Where, uh, where do we start? If you are an incumbent, no, uh, like most of us in this field are, very few, very few in the world are now greenfield operator. Rakuten is one of them. Um, and another one in one and one in Germany, you know. But for greenfield operator, for a newcomer in the in the industry, because they don't have existing infrastructure, they don't have existing network, it's a no-brainer to go for Oran. Maybe it's in a pre-Oran standard or developing Oran standard. It's almost no-brainer, no. The choose to the, the choice, no, to proceed with open run is almost you know uh, academic no it's really about deploying the latest technology uh, that is already available or emerging no? the question is for brownfield operator right uh, because you have to understand the value of the infrastructure that you're providing or that you're that you're bringing into the to the ecosystem versus the incremental revenue that it will create. No? And the operational complexity in terms of introducing it to your overall network and uh, seamlessly uh, integrating it across your infrastructure is also something that has to be tested properly. So for many big operators across the world, no, th this is actually the focus. And this is actually the big question. How do we start? Where do we start? And how do we ensure that when we deploy Open Run, it will not negatively impact the quality of service that we provide, right? So there goes the question. The third question is, are we ready? Are we ready? Is our operation infrastructure ready? Are our people ready? Are our processes ready? Do we have an understanding of the uh, requirements no, in terms of human capital, in terms of the integration capability that we have to build or, or establish in our existing organizations. Because currently these are uh, being done by, by, of course, by different vendors or system integrators. And is the standards ready, right? So these are important questions that operators across the world, no, uh, are asking to the uh, asking of themselves and the, to the industry standards body, right? So uh, sure, there is a uh, very there is an extremely important um, um, idea that we have to um, to proceed with Oran. It's it's almost um, I would say it's wrong not to do it, no. But and but but where do we start and how do we prepare ourselves? No, I think that's why the importance of uh, um, 
Asia Open Run Academy comes into play. That's why we're here, because we need to make sure that the human capital is ready, the infrastructure, um, um, the, you know, the, the organization infrastructure will be ready. At the end of the day, it boils down to the knowledge and understanding of the people in, in this area. And there are still a lot of questions. You know? There are still a lot of questions in, in terms of network design, in terms of how do we introduce it in the network. We need to make sure that how overall, you know, how is how will, how will it impact the other supporting components of the open run? You no, know? the trans, transport requirements, you know? the maturity of the standards. You know, as I mentioned earlier, how do we make sure that when we introduced open run in the architecture our procurement process will change our dimensioning process procurement strategy will change even the competency of people not only in the network side but also in the support supporting organization will change so, because all of a sudden you are dealing with more software rather than hardware the hardware can be on the cloud or it can be on premise but it's really it's more about integrating uh, these different components. It's pretty much like buying, you know, a laptop and loading it with a lot of software, software in it, and then you have a, there you have a mobile network. That's an extreme example, but that is how um, uh, the open run is evolving. Uh, and this is there is a this is, this important component of the organization uh, that should handle the system integration. This is not there today you know, in all uh, mobile organization. Uh, this is being, this is already when the system is delivered you know, to the, um, the, the mobile operator, it's already fully integrated, right? And then the interoperability across different components of the infrastructure in the network to make sure that your your services are running properly is something that also has to be taken care of, right? Plus, of course, the continuing the continuing development uh, that has to be conducted by by mobile operators. So there is a lot of still uncertainty. Uh, well, um, and it happened also before in the beginning of five G. Uh, and now it's happening also in the beginning of 6G, uh, as we are also involved in the development of 6G. But in addition to in addition to that, the concept of disaggregation, which is open run for the radio system, is also happening. Right. So far, uh, what have we? What are we seeing you know, in in the industry? Uh, there are different operators you know, uh, that has started uh, testing the open run solutions you know there's about 106 companies participated in in test six test location you no know? uh, but uh, when you look at it uh, you can see rakuten softbank etc and and you can also see docomo you no know? um, deutsche orange orange or orange in german in, in france vodafone bt these are these are, you know, they have started looking at it, no? looking at it. No? They haven't implemented a live network yet, but uh, they are, uh, they are, they know and they acknowledge that, and that, that uh, this thing is going to happen. Uh, we have this version information as well, because we're part of this uh, global alliance of mobile network operators are also looking at this aggregation along with, with the major telco here, uh, Deutsche, Orange, Docomo, uh, Vodafone, and BT. You know? So uh, in, in that forum, uh, we're actually defining already the operator's requirement you know, on um, the open run, you know? functional requirement, not technical, not technical specification. So we wanted the, the standards making body to understand the use cases that ORAN or disaggregation will bring uh, to, to, or the use cases that are important to the mobile operators that ORAN, that open run should, uh, should address. No? And uh, the, the, the standards making body are 
uh, seriously looking into that, we have published a paper in NGMN, Next Generation Mobile Network Alliance, in, in terms of coming up with, with um, an understanding, a common understanding across uh, leading mobile operators across the, across the world of how do we see uh, this aggregation or open run and how it will impact uh, and uh, impact our businesses no? in terms of uh, revenue generation, in terms of innovation, and in terms of uh, cost leadership, meaning simplifying and optimizing our operations. So, Deutsche, you know, if you look at some of the concrete example, um, uh, and, and this has been uh, part of our conversation, you know, uh, Deutsche Telekom, for example, has built an Orland town in Germany of uh, 25 sites. You know? uh the they have they have issued a request for proposal from different vendors uh, because they have modeled it already for their own you know market uh not necessarily this market will be applicable across the globe uh, but you see the one common thing that we've seen happening uh is that it's now the Oper it's now an operator-led discussion. It's not anymore vendors. No, it's not being anymore vendors that are pushing the technology. No, it's it's now because of Open Run, the operators or mobile operators across the world has the venue and the leverage to define the requirements and um, um, encourage the ecosystem players. You know, to push the agenda in order to create a more open environment, a more uh, 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 or an environment where this can be fully integrated uh, uh, and there's no more vendor specific implementation. This is still ongoing and we've seen uh, trials you know, in different countries. And in my last slide, um, you will see the, the support of the government you know, uh, as, uh, as is growing, you know, as mentioned by Doc France earlier. You know? So we've seen that in even UK, Australia, Canada, and the US announced their support you know, for telecom supplier diversity. Right? It's not anymore the big force, you know? it, it, uh, the big force in the supply supplier industry, but it's really making sure that the as it becomes more software, uh, the network becomes more software, or network function becomes more software, there are more um, um, players you know, in the radio and the uh, intelligent controller that uh, is emerging you know, and becoming and making Oran more possible you know, um, and making it more truly open. Right? So, that is what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and uh, I'm open for questions if there are questions. Thank you very much. So I'm seeing the screen now. Uh, hi, I'm Machia Jensa. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so again, uh, this is just a quick intro. Yes, I'm from Globe, ISOC, PageNog, and Apenix. So here I'll be trying to wear a neutral hat. Next slide. Yes. Uh, of course, this is very important. Disclaimer. So the information in this presentation or perspective based on my experiences and exposure to the internet community and does not reflect uh, opinion of my company or other affiliation that I'm connected with. Next slide. Okay, so just a quick look on, on, on the landscape. Um, this is the list of Philippine service uh, providers. Contrary to common knowledge, that's it's only ISPs that play a role in providing services. There's actually a lot. This is more of a rundown on what we have in the Philippines. So uh, not really a range in hierarchy, but just listing in terms of function. Uh, first is the telco ISPs, which are multi-service providers. These are the ones that provide mobile services uh, as well. And next is ISPs without mobile service, but they provide interconnectivity. We also have cable TVs who traditionally provide you know, uh, cable services, uh, but eventually provide internet services. There's a big or a huge jump into uh, th this kind of services now because Philippines is an archipelago, so there are a lot of players. 
And then we have enterprise. Uh, these are managed uh, infrastructure normally for businesses and they manage their own network actually. And then we have academe. So the schools, uh, especially if you have multiple campuses and you do research, you have your own infrastructure as well. And then uh, at, at some point, there are like headquarters schools where, where all the connectivity are home and everybody's connected to that specific uh, main building. And then similarly we, for, for government, uh, they also manage their own infrastructure and most of the time home to, to a single entity. Uh, specific to this discussion, we also have like PHO Panayx, as mentioned earlier, where everything is aggregated, where traffic is uh, ideally localized to that infrastructure. And then lastly, we have the pop telco. This is really more of, on, on the edge networks of the islands, uh, small islands, big islands, but specific to that part of the infrastructure, that's where you find this uh, pop telcos. Now, infrastructure-wise, uh, this is more of a generic layout on how we have the connectivity. So I'm gonna play along with acronyms here. Uh, let's do this from left to right. Uh, Leftmost side, the happy face circle guy is the end user. Then it has to go to a physical infrastructure, last mile, and then goes to the DC, which is a data center, and then goes to a domestic local loop or DLL and then goes to a CLS, the cable landing station, and then uh, IPL. This is really more of infrastructure connectivity, whether domestic or international. If you go to the international part, that's where you go to site end. And basically you just mirror what's on the left side. It will be exactly similar on the right side. This is an end-to-end -end connectivity, let's say from Philippines to another uh, country. Next slide, please. And then for interconnection, so we're, we're talking about uh, uh, wireless here, open RAN specifically. So we, uh, the example I, I provided is really more for mobile. Uh, this is in a way a hierarchy. Uh, please go back to the next slide. Hierarchy. Uh, main connectivity starts from the international gateway, which is what we call the, the border router. And then connected to that is the distribution router, the local gateway. Ideally, that setup is wired. And then when you go to the access network, all the way going to the eyeballs, to the users, that's where you go wireless. Uh, this is very predominant in the Philippines because we have islands, we have you know, uh, mountains, we have remote areas. That, that's where wireless comes in. But I like to put on a point here, since I'm coming from uh, the NOG, where normally we discuss internet interconnection, uh, optimization, and that comes into peering or basically access to uh, the internet. So the peering part optimizes everything, all components. Uh, for, for this example, uh, normally everything is ideally wired, but depends on your location, depends on uh, where you are or how reachable you'll be, then there will be some components that will be wireless. Next. Okay. And then, uh, you know, uh, based on that intro, this is uh, more of le that's the perspectives. It's, it's an availability game, basically. Uh, so at one, one time, I was asked, uh, oh, actually, uh, how is the fiber penetration in the Philippines? So I said, I think that's uh, not really the right question to ask. So because Philippines is an archipelago, right? So we actually utilize what we have available, whether it's wired, whether it's wireless, whether it's fiber, copper, even coax. Uh, the main objective is to get connectivity regardless of, of medium. And then uh, another perspective that I like to point out is the business perspective. So this might sound that, you know, it's all really revenue, et cetera, et cetera. But to be frank and open about it, there is always cost involved. And when there's cost, we need more or less a uh, return on investment. So basically there's a business case. So th th this kind of uh, question always comes up. Oh, why don't I have uh, available service in this area? Why is the signal low? Why is the other part okay? Blah, 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 Th those kind of stuff. It's because uh, 
from an infrastructure and, and, and building of infra perspective that actually related to the business one. So we will probably build more or most of, of the setup will be more on areas where there are more users compared in a specific area where there's one. It, it doesn't make, make sense to actually uh, extend your facility there because uh, business-wise, it's not really sustainable. So that's the, the question that, that really uh, matters. And at the same time, that becomes also an opportunity where we can have the open RAN setup actually come in, where, where, where the parts that uh, for most of the infrastructure is not available, that's where we, we come in. So it's, it's, it's really uh, where you want to play and what you need to do. Next slide. And then um, there's also the service perspective. So, I mean, when you provide a service, there is uh, some sort of uh, guarantee. So that's actually uh, SLA or ser service level uh, availability. And basically that's the uptime of the service you, you provide. And normally when you want to provide a good uptime, wired has, wired, I mean, wired connectivity has a uh, better reliability. Like uh, some may not agree, but you know, uh, wired headsets or wired speakers have, have better sound quality compared to you know, Bluetooth or, or wireless. So anyway, so other topic. But I mean, on SLA perspective, uh, it's always wired, like fiber has, has a better uh, uptime or service ability. That's why, I mean, design-wise, you, you start with that. And then maybe not really as last resort, but on the, on the availability of resources, that's where you, you go to, to wireless. Again, there are different perspectives, like because mobile, you're just, if your user base is, is you know, uh, nomadic or going around the time, it doesn't make, to, doesn't make sense to put a uh, fixed infrastructure there because you need to follow the actual users. But I mean, the, the te 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 technology basically improves and eventually we will get there. And then uh, there's also an evolution of, of the SLA because like initially you have probably uh, extended a wireless facility to serve that area. And eventually if there's proper volume, you build a wired infrastructure to make sure it has a good uh, uptime for SLA. Next slide. And then the, uh, yeah, the community perspective. So, I mean, this is a very important uh, especially now, it's it's really uh, collaboration. So I wrote here a uh, collaboration on the top, and then uh, the bottom is multi-stakeholder. But the key here is basically awareness. So if you don't know, if you're not aware, then you know you cannot collaborate. Uh, it, it goes two ways. If there's multi-stakeholder, but you don't talk, you don't know who to talk to, you can't collaborate. So it's basically an awareness uh, campaign. Exactly what we're trying to do here, providing you know perspective, providing insights. Uh, some networks or some uh, providers may have already tackled this one and it can help help us by sharing their perspective and then uh, vice versa. Uh, for community, uh, PHNOG, this is a very, very good three point um, uh, action points, I mean. Next slide. And then, uh, you know, Putting it all together, we have all those perspectives. But you know, there's a driving force that needs to be uh, backing that up. And normally, when when you you say infrastructure or network, it's always uh, a physical uh, infra, uh, you know, a base station, equipment, router, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you always forget the people network, and that's actually the the, the community, which. I personally think is the one driving uh, everything. You know, so you have you have your your physical stuff, but you need someone to actually drive that. And the driving force it, it, for this one uh, for 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 this discussion, what I'm telling is 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 the NOG. Uh, from our point of view, uh, the Philippines we have the the Philippine Network Operators Group, which is uh, Page NOG, and you know each country has their NOG, and Page NOG is part of the Asia Pacific. What we try to you know promote here is uh, you know collaboration, knowledge sharing, and most importantly you know uh, neutral ground 
uh, sometimes everything becomes very formal. Uh, there's some sort of demarcation. There's some sort of hierarchy. You are the boss. This is a the subordinate. Blah blah blah. But for the dog, it's not a gun. You can you know, speak what what you want and speak speak your mind. As just make sure we are more or less on on the same or aligned uh, direction. Or if not, it's a perspective that everyone and can learn. So that's actually what I want to to share. And 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 and, and probably ending this one is uh, regardless of our you know role, uh, in a small scale or big scale, it really more of collaboration and. and trying to help as much as you can. Let's get our hands uh, dirty. Next slide, and that will be, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, good evening, um, everyone. So um, so for this afternoon, so I'll be talking about the academic perspective. So here right now you can see in the, what's shared in the screen is actually more of like a specific question. So uh, how the universities will prepare the skills needed by the telcos and the industries, but actually, um, well, I, I'm going to leave it there, but I actually want to take a step back and actually go back to the to the main um, theme of the forum this evening, which is on the future of Open RAN uh, from the academic uh, from the academics uh, academics perspective. So, I, I mean, specifically on how the universities and the and the academe can affect the trend and the development of the telco technologies, uh, specifically Open RAN, and how the academy, uh, in coordination with the universities, can facilitate this endeavor, or this movement. So next slide, please. So of course, um, the most obvious answer, and in trying to answer the, the question that was put as, as the title slide of my, of my talk, is to actually share knowledge. So firstly, uh, the academe can share knowledge through teaching. So by incorporating the open RAN topics to their core courses, or you know presenting it as special topics or electives, or even actually as uh, standalone or dedicated graduate uh, program courses. Or and also, I think there's also a realization recently because uh, again that has been pushed by the pandemic, where a lot of the learning is now happening online. Um, I think some of universities are actually allowing um you know all those uh, massive online courses that you can take anywhere to be actually credited so and of course you know whatever aura can be one of those and aside from teaching of course the universities uh, can also serve as the as a supply for the resource persons for the academy so yeah um next slide please and so of course um as a result of sharing knowledge uh, and and also going back into the to the main question, like what it is that can that the universities can actually do uh, for Open RAN is to uh, actually generate knowledge. So uh, and in sharing knowledge, uh, one of the main things that we actually generate, or like a, as a proxy, like is to actually generate well-equipped graduates uh, with the skills that allows them to be the the resource uh, for the industry and also be the sources of knowledge as well, or the you know the the generators of knowledge as well. Uh, and of course, uh, to further generate knowledge, um, the academy can also conduct research that not only pushes uh, the state of the art uh, in telecommunication technologies, but also uh, pursuing research that has social impact, especially in better connecting Asia, hence uh, informing policy with research. So, you know, doing research that informs policy. So as as I think um, all the previous uh, my co uh, resource persons have said earlier, you know, Dr. Franz, Achi, and then uh, Arvin, they've all said about you know it is a business case and it's also a government case, and all, all even the people in the you know the attendees, the, the participants know that you know and are aware you know that all of these uh, there are different perspectives, there are different cases, and hence there is actually it is actually important that the government actually sets up the policy. Uh, to support that as well. Okay, so next slide. Um, this is actually a, going to be my last slide, so it's it was a very it, it's going to be a very quick portion for me. So to be actually the you know the universities or the academy can be the nexus of knowledge. So I say it in plural because the various academic partners so can actually serve as the host of the academy or sort of like the physical presence or the physical extension of the academy's presence. And secondly, 
uh, as the nexus or the center link of the of knowledge, um, the universities or the uh, academic institutions or academic partners can serve as the neutral ground for collaboration with various industry, government, and all other uh, stakeholders. So what I've discussed actually are, you know, just broad strokes because all of the previous um, resource persons have really, you know, sort of um, pin the point on certain perspectives and, you know, as the, as the university or the academic perspective. So here, uh, what we offer is to be, to be the nexus of, of knowledge, you know, of all of this, that's ne what is necessary, what's being required by, you know, for the, for, to, you know, to better deliver services, specifically, you know, telco, telco services, and also, you know, uh, to, to push the technology further. And of course, just, uh, yeah, to wrap up my, uh, my portion. So ultimately, as with all other uh, technological endeavors, so all these can be realized with the support of the industry and the government. So and to, pro to provide specifically in providing resources to realize the goals of the academy in capacitating Asia uh, for Open RAN and other emerging uh, telco technologies. So that's it. Thank you. That's for my part. Thank you so much, um, JB. Very interesting points also. Uh, we want to move now into our Q&A section. I see already that there are quite a few questions um, being posted in the chat box. Uh, just to build on one of them, um, I'm sure a lot of you have lots of questions. Um, Glenn posted about what the government's perspective is and Dr. Leon did post um, a response there. But just to add on to that question, um, it has been raised in previously about the government's ability to also operate as an operator. Is this something that would be feasible potentially um, for the Philippines, for the government in order to fully achieve um, their goal of digital transformation? Or perhaps um, is the Philippine government more looking for the telcos to lead the way um, in this arena? Again, these questions are open. Multiple panelists are feel free to um, answer and respond as you see fit. Yeah. But I guess this will be for Doc France. Yeah, um, I think since the government has liberalized the economy and the, the policies for uh, telecoms, I guess uh, the government is pushing really to be the telecom industry to be market driven. Hence, um, we have um, several operators now. I don't really th see uh, the government um, participating as, a, as an operator uh, moving forward. I haven't heard anything um, similar to, to that um, idea. So probably in the next uh, couple of years, I'm pretty sure that it will still be more uh, market driven uh, from our current operators. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, one other question we have in the chat box here is from Teddy on why. Sorry, is Ar I, sorry, Catherine. I think Arvid has something to say. Yeah. Oh, sure. Catherine, can I can I also pitch into oh. that? Go ahead. Right, go so, ahead. So sorry. Yeah, thank you. I agree with Doc Franz because you know the the Philippines is a the telecommunications uh, industry in the Philippines where all in place is actually a deregulated industry, right? But there is also another area uh, where government can can stimulate no the the creation of the new eco eco ecosystem or new. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the the ecosystem in Oran, especially in the supplier environment, is growing, right? So there is an opportunity for. For us, no, the Filipinos to be the center of excellence, no, in the Asia Pacific for creating and innovating, or creating software or network function, no, that uh, can compete across the globe, no. You can compete with the likes of Nokia, Ericsson, uh, Huawei by creating that software environment um, that can be used by operator because it's anyway open, no. Uh, the Operating system will be open. The ecosystem will be open. So this is one of our dreams, actually, in in Open Run Academy, where you create this environment, vendor environment in in the Philippines, that can compete globally. You no, know? uh, so uh, there could be probably something that the government can do in terms of uh, stimulating it or coming up with an incent incentive for for uh, this. Uh, uh, 
new players in the supplier ecosystem to you know to to uh, join no so imagine if philippines will be the supplier of network gear right uh, <laughs> yeah uh, where uh, you you will be supplying probably the, to the likes of singtel in in, in singapore telecom malaysia or any any other mobile operator across the globe because we are also uh full of developers no full we have we have this human capital in terms of software development so we 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 can we can tap on that no? we can we can improve that no we just have to make sure that the the intellectual property is strong no uh, the, the 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 environment is there where they can test it and that will actually be one of the open run trust no? to give uh, the open run academy trust no? to give a playing field no? or a laboratory provide laboratory systems where um, developers can test develop test their systems or software systems uh, that is related to an open run Okay, that's so my you... that's my short answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, you 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 talked a little bit about you know the software side of things. Um, you know, one thing with the current legacy wireless systems is you know how much everything is tied to the hardware. Um, so just posing this out to the group, but um, I'm going to say as RAN is moving, not if RAN is moving, but as RAN is moving towards um, more software. Um, versus hardware based, et cetera. Uh, do you think that is essentially inevitable uh, to move or to consider open RAN, particularly in places like uh, the Philippines and the Indo Pacific? Yeah, the, the 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 quick answer is yes. No, we we should <laughs> we should we should consider that. Now, not only we should consider, we we have to do something about it. No, it's only a matter of time because uh, the how do you call it? The ship has left the port, right? So it, it's really a matter of time, but in, in in terms of standard and also a matter of timing for the mobile mm -hmm. operators. So it, it's going to be there. Um, I, I have no doubt about that. So why then is open RAN critical for 5G and potentially 6G? I know this is being discussed in some parts of the world now um, as internet continues to uh, move forward. I can I can take that too if that's okay. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so so as we deploy, uh, you know, we are deploying most of the operators across the across the globe have started deployment of five G, right? And uh, uh, many in many markets they have saturated four G already or LTE, right? But the next mm -hmm. question is how do we deploy now five G? We know that five G is faster than four G. In so many ways, uh, and and uh, it it has better quality. But do you deploy five G using the same hardware infrastructure as four G? Right, that is the big question actually. So uh, definitely, some new new operators, or we call them we call them greenfield operators, started deploying five G infrastructure using an open run system already. Right. They are they are actually betting on it, even if the standard is not yet fully open. Uh, but they are betting on it already because they see the potential. Uh, we haven't seen yet any brownfield operator that has claimed a successful um, implementation in terms of total cost of ownership and the cost and benefit. That's actually the, the areas that we are very interested in. You know? But but. Talking about new or greenfield operator, yes, as I mentioned in my uh, presentations, there are a number of them that has, that has started already. It has, uh, you know, uh, taken that leap of faith you know, that it's going to be an open run you know, moving forward. Excellent. We have a lot of attendees here today. Um, 124, not to try and hog the Q&A section, but I uh, just want to open it up to the floor. I do note there is a question here from Earl about um, an organization or a group where, quote unquote, new guys like us can join. Um, do any of you have a response to that? And then Teddy also has a follow-up question in the chat box about the difference between Open RAN, ORAN, and VRAN. I, I can jump in on Earl's question. So. 
start an organization or, or group you know from a community perspective you no know, of course I, i'm not really promoting you know the knob or something similar to that but i i come back to what i said earlier is because of awareness so it, it's really more of a communication when we when we started before you know the the, the page nog was like nowhere it's there entity wise is established but you, you're not aware that that something is going on so we need to like spread the word uh maybe to uh, a quick answer to that one we can start with you know you, you being involved in in the open and academy and then try to join you know lo local uh related operations events like like the nog and actually next month we will have uh apricot 2023 Manila, where where Philippines is the host, and Page Nog and USD Asti uh, score organizing uh, support. So those are venues where you can actually uh, collaborate, communicate, and and get updates. Anything specific, you don't need to limit yourselves. I mean, this can be as open uh, as possible. Individual ob objectives can be can vary uh, depending what you need to achieve. Yeah, yeah, and also we do have the academy website under construction for official wants. Hopefully, in a couple of weeks. So um, definitely keep an eye out on that and our newsletter. Um, we really do try and pull information across from different organizations just to kind of keep people up to date. Uh, definitely looking forward to the apricot conference also that's coming up thanks so much tony for pinging that up on the screen right now um do we have any oh someone would like to address teddy's question there on the chat box about the difference between open ran oran and vran um also just really quickly we are working on getting our 2022 webinars um online which potentially could also um, respond to that question but just real quick I'll, I'll 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 take the question very quick no uh but but uh my 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 teammates here then can actually answer that in text no so the difference between open run v run and v run so 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 the uh, d run is what we have right now the distributed run right uh, that is the we call it now legacy uh radio access network now that's the current one the v run is actually a virtualized run but that is already open right so it's the first step to open run right virtualize the the separation of uh, hardware and software right that's the first step but it's being separated within the same vendor or supplier right they have different ways of uh, disintegrating uh, the components so but it's within the same the same the same vendor uh, system open run is really you know you separate it and you make it inter interoperable across the standard sets of uh, specifications and that the customer like uh, mobile network operator can pick and choose uh, whatever supplier for hardware, software, uh, integration, etc. So that's, that's in a nutshell, the, the differences between DRAN, VRAN, and ORAN or Open RAN. Thanks so much, Arvin. Um, do we have any more questions? Sorry, I was just looking at the Q&A box. I didn't look to, sorry, I didn't look to the, the chat box. Um, uh, Karen, can I say something? Yeah, yeah, jump in. Sorry, I was just scrolling through the chat box because yeah, I, mean, I was uh, the Q and A box open. My, uh, my 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 point is like going back to the previous question is why is Open RAN critical for for five G? So I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna be like a devil's advocate here. <laughs> not, it's not not really a question of of five G, four G, Open RAN or RAN. It, it's really just doing uh, the setup right so it's not you know doing 5g or 4g or open run just for like compliance because you need to you may you need to make sure that it actually works so i'm, I'm going to give a specific example like for 5g uh throughput is high bandwidth is high but most of the time there's another component that is being left out which is latency which is the real timeness of the transport of data so the use cases normally is like Ah, uh, you have tried five G. Uh, you can do like a remote uh, clinical operation because you know the transfer of of data is almost real time. But if you have 
asymmetric uh, connectivity like the the, the route go is you know internet is two way uh you know upload and, and download if it that's not symmetric then probably the reply will not be as real time as possible so the 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 very bad example that if, if it's like a, a remote operation in a clinic, the patient can die because, you know, the reply couldn't yeah. go back as real time as possible. So my point is, uh, although, yes, we need to go there, we need to make sure that we, we do it for the right reason, not just for compliance. That's a very, very good point, Anche. Thanks so much for bringing that up. Do we have any final questions or comments? Questions from attendees, comments from panelists at this stage? <clears throat> Catherine, I'm, I'm looking at the chat box and there's a question about security, right? Is uh, security ensured in open run networks? I mean, how is the security ensured in open run networks? So Take it away. I, I'm not seeing that question, but go ahead. Yeah, I can see it. So, I, I don't know, maybe JV or Doc Franz can take the, <laughs> the yeah, security yeah. aspect. Um, actually, I answered a bit. So that's one of, I guess, that's one of the key trade off for having the open and architecture. So um, you have several options for a particular component. And every time there will be an innovation or update or change in any of the layer, then you will have to do testing. And I guess there are several measures several checklists that must be made to ensure uh, security across uh, the whole um, stack. Um, and to be honest, it would really be pointless going with Open Run if security is not as good or even better with the current architecture. That's all. Great, thanks, um, Doc Franz. I know one of the webinars that we had did touch on this topic of security um, and also an article I read talking about the different layers of security depending on um, the, the distributor, the operator, and, and also the host as well. So you're you know, looking at having potential multiple layers um, of security as well, uh, but definitely an arena that needs to be explored further and more in depth. And it's something that we can consider for future, future webinars. If I may add, Katrina, so mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, Security, or we say cybersecurity, is always uh, it's always there. No, the, the challenge is always there. It will not go away. Uh, uh, and as the technology, the security mechanism to protect our infrastructure evolves rapidly, so as those on the other. In in some ways, uh, they are evolving faster you know, than the security posture of the of the infrastructure no they are more creative no uh, those uh, uh, i would say security breacher are more creative than the security posture of some no uh, but again this is, is going to be a continuous innovation uh, in uh, the industry we're not nobody saying that we are uh, ha we have 100% uh, or we are 100% secure no um, uh, i don't think I don't think there's a claim for that, but people can say we have a very resilient security framework, right, or environment, no? and that will go on and on. And, and any technology that evolves, or the security security is part and parcel of the um, protection mechanism. No, it, it cannot be treated independently. It's always part of the uh, the evolution. Very, very true. Yeah. Well, at this stage, if we don't have any more questions, um, we do have a post-event evaluation form that Tony will be sending around. We would be very grateful um, if you guys could fill that out for us also so we can get your feedback on these sessions and how we can really tailor them to the different um, you know, needs as was brought up here, quote unquote, are we ready to deploy Open RAN? You know, and part of what we hope to achieve here with these webinars is, is really providing information and knowledge to allow the workforce development in the Philippines to get to a point where it is indeed ready to deploy um, Open RAN. So Tony, if you can just uh, send that link around, that would be great. Yeah. And then just quick update on future trainings and schedules. If you wanna just ping that up there on the screen who our next um, speakers are gonna be.
Just again, thank you. thank you all for joining us for the, you know, the relaunch of our 2023 um, knowledge sharing public lecture series or no pulse as we're calling them, building on what we've been doing in 2022. Um, here we go. Our next schedule coming up, we have the 21st of January, Mahesh Kassar from Rakuten Symphony will be speaking to us about their open software centric and cloud native approach to building future ready mobile networks, um, you know, as a disruptive force to shift the center of gravity from hardware to software across telecoms. And then to close out January, uh, we will have Professor Ji Zhang from the University of Sheffield in the UK to present on ORAN simulation for some typical use cases. So uh, those of you who are here should already have um, signed up and will be getting notifications for these. As always, do remember to use your um, same login uh, for future webinars. We look forward to your participation, attendance, and continued feedback. Uh, and again, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, Tony has our certificates of appreciation um, for the four of you, which she'll be emailing out shortly. And uh, Tony, do you have anything else in closing? <laughs>